Let's pray together. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear whatever your word buried in the midst of these words is. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve you, we might serve our neighbors. In the name of Christ, amen. So at my house, I am the errand boy. Uh, I don't know, I get the, would you take this by the, um, the post office for me on your way to work? Yes, of course. Would you stop and pick up dog food? Yes, of course. Would you go by the grocery store and get, you know, whatever? And I, it's always fine. I actually don't mind doing it. I kind of like doing it. Um, but unless it's one of those things like, um, find, I need creme de coco in 16 ounce. I'm like, oh, please don't make me do that. I will never find that. And so I am the, I am the errand boy. D, on the other hand, is the messenger. So she is the hub of all communications within our family. If, if she dies, uh, I, my children may move away and I will never know. Um, <laughs> because there just is not, uh, I, she, everything comes through her and out from there that comes back in and back out again. She is the messenger. W when we used to have a home phone line, we have, we have canceled our home phone line now. We just have cell phones. We, we still give the number out to people, though, by the way, if we don't want them to call us. But uh, so if you get, if I give you my home phone, it's not a good sign. Uh, but all of the, you know, anytime you have to register for something, I give the home phone. And whoever gets it next is going to be really sad. But uh, anyway, it, it, uh, people would call. The girls would call, and I'd answer the phone, and I'd say, hi, how are you? And they'd say, how are you? Uh, can I talk to mom, or uh, would you like to talk to mom? I mean, that's just the way it was. She's the messenger. And what I've come to understand is that messengers are really important. We're going to talk today about a messenger. Judas Barsabbas is a messenger. Um, his, his job is to carry a message. Here's the story. It is, uh, it is really the tail end of, of one of the most important stories in the New Testament. Uh, this is called the Jerusalem Council. Uh, probably the most important moment after the, after the Pentecost story, after the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, is in Acts 15. So uh, there were two primary centers of early Christianity. One was Jerusalem. The apostles were there. The, uh, uh, Peter was there. Uh, John uh, was there. James, the brother of Jesus, was there. Um, that's where really the, the center of accountability was. 300 miles north in, in, was a town called Antioch. And many Jews had already left to go to Antioch. And the, the church there was thriving. Antioch is uh, now what is modern Antakya, which is the capital of Turkey. And in fact, um, is uh, just north of the Syrian border. So it's a strange place for the capital of Turkey to be. It's, it's in the very bottom tip. So th this was Paul's home church. This is where, he, where uh, Christians were first called Christians. Um, this is where Paul was sent out. Every time on his missionary journeys, he'd come back to Antioch. He'd uh, sort of uh, nurse his wounds. He'd get fired up again and they'd send him out again. They'd lay hands on him and send him out. Now here's the difference, is that in Antioch there were many Gentiles that were part of the church. That was not so much the case in Jerusalem, but in, in Antioch there were lots of Gentiles that were there. And the scripture says at the very beginning of Acts 15 that certain men, I love the way they said this, so if anytime you see certain people, that's you can put that voice in it because he was not happy about them. Certain men, Luke says, ha ha had gone to Antioch and told the Gentiles there that if they were to be Christians, they had to convert to, to Judaism. They had to convert to Judaism. The men had to be circumcised. They had to agree to follow all of the laws of, of Israel, all of the purity laws, all the ethical laws uh, that they were to live under the law, and that basically uh, Christianity was just another sect of Judaism. 
uh, this just infuriated Paul. And it created this incredible controversy in Antioch. And so Paul says, we're going to get to the bottom of it. And so as he heads out on his next missionary journey, he says, I'm going to go on to Jerusalem. And we're going to talk to the, to the apostles there. And we're going to get an agreement. We're going to get this figured out. So he gets to, uh, to Jerusalem. And in fact, in Jerusalem, there is this sense that, yeah, yeah, we're, gonna, we're, we're all Jews. And we continue to live according to Jewish custom. And Paul says... Uh, hey, man, you should see what the Holy Spirit is doing in the lives of Gentiles. I have been traveling. I have been seeing it. Lives are being changed. Great miracles are being done through these Gentiles. They are living by the Spirit. And we can't ask them to change their identity, to change who they are in that way. They have to. We, the Holy Spirit is at work in them. And so they have a powwow. And finally, after much debate... Uh, it ultimately is both, both Peter and finally James, the brother of Jesus, says, here's the deal. No, they don't have to be circumcised. No, they don't have to follow all the rules, all the laws of Israel. All that is required is that they refrain from sexual immorality, that they don't eat the food sacrificed to idols, that they don't eat meat that has been uh, strangled with blood, which is an interesting uh, you know, it, it, what, what is so clear when you read this is this was the result of a negotiation, right? They've come to, a, they've come to an agreement. And so how are they going to let the church at Antioch know that? Well, let's send Paul and Barnabas back there. Let's write a letter. We're going to write a letter. We're going to send it to them with Paul and Barnabas. But we also are going to send Silas and Judas Barsabbas. And they are going to tell people about this. So this was so essential to get the word out throughout all of the churches that, in fact, Gentiles were a part of the church. So I want, I want us to look at Judas Barsabbas, and I think there are four things we can quickly learn from what it means to be a messenger. Here's the first one. Messengers are sent. They're not just called, but they're sent. It's a different picture. So uh, look at what the scripture says. Acts 15, 22. They sent Judas called Barsabbas. Seven times in this scripture alone, they use the word send or sent. That's really important. That's a, that changes your identity when you think of yourself as sent. United Methodist pastors are sent. We aren't, I was not, Katie was not called by St. Luke's to be the pastor. I was sent by the United Methodist Church to be the pastor. So my accountability is not to you all. My accountability is to the church. They're the ones who sent me. It changes your picture. Uh, one of the visions, the, so Luke writes in Acts, he uses the word sent. Paul uses a little different word. He uses the word ambassador. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, says this way, for uh, 520. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. Ambassadors. Uh, George Schultz was the uh, Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan. And he had this little thing he did, which I thought was so interesting. When uh, a new ambassador had been appointed, to, to, uh, um, chosen to go to some country, he would call them as Secretary of State into his office. And he'd say, I want to test you. Show me your country on the globe. Like, I, I wonder if you can really find the country we're sending you to, since it's sort of an honor to be chosen. I'm going to test you. Show me your country on the globe. And so if you were going to be the ambassador of Japan, you'd go and find Japan on the globe and you'd point it out. And if you were going to be the ambassador to Uruguay, you'd go to the map to the globe and point out Uruguay. And every time George Schultz said, wrong. Your country is the United States of America. That's where you belong. That is your accountability. It's to us. And we send you to that place, but you are a part of us. Um, the scripture tells us that our citizenship, Philippians, Paul writes in Philippians, your citizenship is in heaven. We are, our citizenship, the, the country to which we belong, is the kingdom of God. And we have been, our citizenship is in heaven, and we have been sent into the world 
for a purpose, to deliver a message. We have that, that, call, that sending, that's the way to say it, on our lives. And there'll be a day when we go back home again, right? When scripture says, John says, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am you may be also. But when we understand ourselves, as Judas did, as people who are sent, it changes the way we experience things. It changes our identity to remind us that we're messengers, that we have mission. All right, here's the second thing. Messengers move beyond their comfort zone. So if, uh, if, I, I, if you had your Bibles, if you do have your Bibles, you can look, and I would invite you to look at verse 34. Verse 34 is very important. There is no verse 34 in your Bible. That will throw you off because in most of the Bibles that you have, NIV, NRSV, um, ESV, there is no verse 34. In the old Bibles, in the King James Version and some others, there was a verse 34. Uh, here's the reason. This is a little bit of Bible scholar nerd, nerdness, but uh, there, there are two sort of groups of manuscripts of the New Testament. One was called the Western text, and one is called the Alexandrian text. And for the longest time, the Western text was the most ancient of the manuscripts. And so it included a verse 34. King James used the Western text. And that verse 34 said this, Silas, remain, child, Silas chose to remain in Antioch. They're drawing a distinction between Judas Barsabbas, who went back home, and Silas, who remained. The, after time, the archaeologists discovered older manuscripts. They were able to date these Alexandrian manuscripts to older time. And so most modern Bibles have left out verse 34 now because they were not in the, the Alexandrian manuscript. My point here is just to draw that contrast to say that the Judas Barsabbas didn't really want to be in Antioch. He wanted to be in Jerusalem. He wanted to be in his home. But he, he decided that he was sent so he would go. We are called to get out of our comfort zone, to do those things that are not always easy for us. Uh, those who know me best, those are staff people and others, know that I am at my heart a real introvert. I, I would much rather be in my study with my books. I would much rather go to dinner with two friends than and, and if, I, if I get that invitation to a party or an event, whew, I have to suck it up. And, and I think to myself, let's go. Let's do this thing, right? Because I realize that part of my sending is to a large community of people. It's to a, a, a group of folks. And so sometimes you just Got to stand up in front of people and talk to them. One of the reasons I love preaching is because you can't talk back to me, right? Uh, I don't have to listen to you in any way. I, uh, the, you, you might as well not be here. No, that's not true. But, uh, but sometimes you've got, you feel called. You've got to step out of that which is, is uh, comfortable to you. Because why? Because the mission is more important than our comfort. God doesn't call us to be comforted, to be comfortable. That's what I meant to say. So um, let me just suggest that sometimes you're sitting there and you get, a, you get a tug, a tug on your heart that says, I really need to do that thing. I, I really need to be a summer Sunday school teacher. Did you, did you tell them they needed to be summer Sunday school teachers? All right. I really, I know, I really need to do it. And then you think, Nah, I, I don't want to do that. And if I say yes, then I'm just going to regret it. I, I, ah. uh, Stephen Pressfield wrote a book called The War of Art, and I love the book. Uh, actually, um, Sid Davis recommended it to me. And in it, he talks about what he calls resistance. That every time you've, you've, you, you uh, have this uh, sense in which you need to move forward, there's always going to be this resistance that pops up that says to you, eh. 
If we are, in fact, to be messengers, we've got to move outside of our comfort zone. It may make us uncomfortable to talk to someone and say, hey, why don't you come visit us at St. Luke's? Why don't you come to church? It may make us uncomfortable to say to somebody, hey, um, I'll be praying for you. It may make us uncomfortable to say, can I pray with you? It may make us uncomfortable to pray in public. There's all sorts of those places that they just, our comfort zone goes, I don't think so. But the sending of God is to push outside of the place where we're comfortable. All right, here's the, here's the third thing. Messengers join the chorus. What that, what I, what I, so, so here's where, what the scripture tells us, Acts 15, 27. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same thing by word of mouth. In other words, here's the, we've got a letter. We've sent you a letter, but that wasn't enough. We needed some other people to come alongside and say, hey, this is, this is what I call the uh, everybody knows that um, rule is that, you know, when you start saying to people, well, well, everybody knows that St. Luke's is the best church anywhere. Then people start to believe that St. Luke's is the best church, and they actually believe that everybody knows that, right? The idea is come along together. One of the most significant um, uh, leadership lessons for me comes from a little video. I have loved this video for a long time called The Dancing Man. Many of you may have seen it. I want to encourage you to go look at, look at it online. It begins with this crazy fool who decides to dance on, at a concert. He's at a, on a hillside at a concert, and he doesn't have a shirt on, and here's a picture of this fool, and he, you can't see it, and the, the video's too long, so I'd show you the video. But he's dancing, and he dances by himself for quite a while. He's the leader. But then after a while, a second guy comes up and dances beside him. And now you have two people dancing like complete fools on the side of a hill. They, they are just dancing like idiots. And then after a few minutes, a third and fourth and fifth person join the dancing. And they continue to dance. And now you've got a bunch of people dancing. You've got five people dancing like complete fools on the side of the hill. And then before you know it, there's an incredible rush. And you see all those people, they all are dancing. I mean, you can, in the video, you see them running in to join the, the, the party. Uh, here's what um, uh, Derek Silvers, who's the teacher, here's what he says. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. To say it is acceptable to dance and I will not be dancing alone. Look, um, it isn't, you know, the leader will get all of the credit. The leader always gets the credit. But the people who make the movement are the first follower and the second follower and the third, fourth, and fifth follower. That's what creates a movement, not the leader. It's the others who say, hey, let's do this together. Come on, let's go. And all of a sudden, there's a, there's a movement of people that come together. I, I, I want to encourage you to say to somebody, hey, come to church with me. Come, let's go do this together. Teach Sunday school with me. Let's do it together. Uh, whatever it is, right? To, to, uh, we have, speaking of getting out of your comfort zone, we have coming up uh, a Meet the Neighbors at our Gethsemane campus where we go out into the actual apartments and have conversation with the people in those apartments and just play with the kids. But let me tell you, when you go out there, it's outside your comfort zone. It's in a different cultural context. But to say to some, well, you know what will make it more comfortable for you? To say, to say, come on, let's do this together. It'll be fun. Join the chorus. All right, here's the last thing. Messengers are not the message. Right? Here's what I love about this, this Judas Barsabbas. I will bet... None, maybe very few, less than 5% of you knew who Judas Persabas was. You, you didn't know. He fades into the background. 
is just another guy. Frankly, it's sort of remarkable they listed him in Scripture. But the truth is, that doesn't matter. Because it's not about us. It's not about Judas Barsabbas. We don't have to be perfect people to be messengers of Christ. We don't have to be, um, uh, uh, quote, significant to, to be used by God, to be sent by God to do God's work. It, it, it is the message that matters, not the messenger. We have 40 young people, 40 uh, high school students and their leaders in the Dominican Republic. And they've been there, they were there this last week, and they were doing, uh, uh, building two uh, one-room houses for members of the congregation that uh, were in need. And they were spending a lot of time playing with students and with kids, children. Our, our students were playing with the kids. And, and, you know, they do a lot of sports ministry there. They play baseball. I think the Dominican Republic kids teach our kids baseball. And, uh, I mean, it's great fun. And so what happens at Go Ministries where these are serving is that throughout the summer, every summer, these groups of people come from different churches from all over, and they play with the kids, and they build stuff. And do you think that the kids can remember each of those names of the kids, the people who come to do that? Of course not. Those children don't know that. But let me tell you something. When they grow up as part of this community at, of, of Go Ministries, when they leave, they understand that there is a God who has sent people in love to share with them God's love. That's the overarching message, that they'll build things and do things. It's, it's amazing what happens when you don't care if you get any credit. All right. I want to close with this. There's a woman in our church who, um, who approached me in the gathering room uh, after church a, a few weeks ago, and uh, she told me this story. She said that a, a number of weeks before that, she had been in the parking lot, and she was coming to church, and she saw a man who seemed to be having a really bad day. And I'm not sure how she could identify that, but she went up to him and said, are you okay? And he said, not really. I'm just having a really bad day. And he didn't really elaborate on the details. And she said, gosh, I'm so sorry. Tell me your name. He told her his name. She told him her name. She sa uh, he, he said, um, she, she said to him, you know, I just want you to know that God loves you, um, that uh, I'm going to be praying for you, and that I believe it's going to turn out all right. And she went on into church. Well, many weeks later, she receives a Facebook post that said, I've been looking for you. I want you to know that what you said to me in the parking lot that day kept me from doing something that I couldn't undo. And she said, I was just overwhelmed that that little thing, that little thing that I said could make that kind of difference. When you feel that tug on your heart, that little, mm, and then the resistance comes up. Ah, oh, push on past it. You've been sent. You've been sent, and you have a message that really matters. God of love, we thank you that our citizenship is in heaven with you, that you have called us, you have sent us to this world, that we, uh, that we can be about your business of your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray, God, that in our sojourn as part of the world around us, we would accomplish that mission and bear your message, that we would be your vessels, your instruments, your messengers to share with the world just how much you love them. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.